Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming today um, to, and welcome you to the second of five Inside Out lectures hosted uh, by the School of Art, Architecture and Design here at Leeds Beckett University and in partnership with the Yorkshire Sculpture International. The mission of the Inside Out lecture series is to bring some of the most interesting and diverse artists and designers working today to inspire and support the work staff and students do across the school. Uh, we invite renowned speakers from around the globe and make the lecture series open both to the general public and also available to the international audience online. And I'm really delighted now to welcome Emily Riddle, who is the Assistant Curator at the Hep of Wakefield, to introduce our guest speaker today, Tarek Atui. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you uh, enormously to Leeds Beckett University on behalf of all of the partners for YSI. Um, for making this series of talks possible. It's really central to what we're aiming to achieve as part of the festival, so thank you to everyone who makes that, that a possibility for us. Um, thank you once again to Tarek for, for being here. Um, for those of you who are new to Tarek's work, um, he's an artist and electroacoustic composer who works with sound performance. Um, his work stems from um, extensive research into music history and instrumentation, um, and he works with, with instrument makers and collaborators from across the world to produce, engineer, um, and develop new, new instruments and new possibilities of, of playing. He um, enables activation of these instruments um, on, a, on a wide variety of scales, both um, from the most intimate, spontaneous activation within a gallery space to um, large-scale public uh, performances within the, within the public realm. Um, he is exploring performance as a dynamic and um, open-ended process a process of um, listening deeply and responding openly. I've avoided the typical um, list of accolade type introductions, um, as I think that the international range of Tarek's work will be um, best demonstrated by his, by his, his speaking about his work. Um, but I should <coughs> mention at this stage, we're delighted to um, share the news that he's been announced as one of the artists in this year's Venice Biennale. Um, so just a few short weeks after installing his work in Venice, he'll be back with us in Yorkshire um, to install his work across, um, across the YSI venues and to organise a series of, of public um, performances out in the, in the public realm. Um, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Tarek. Thanks, Tarek. Thank you, Emily. Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and thank you for coming uh, to this uh, l talk and presentation. So after, after this introduction, it's uh, quite easy to start. And uh, maybe just uh, very quickly about uh, me and where I come from. So my name is Tare Atwi, and I'm a, a composer and a artist working with sound. I'm originally from Beirut in Lebanon, and since about 20 years, I live and uh, work in France, now in Paris. But before landing in Paris, I also <coughs> had a moment in my life where I was traveling extensively, and my practice took me into uh, lots of places throughout the Middle East, and also the, the, the Americas, and uh, the Far East, uh, and to many places uh, in Europe. And actually, I, stu I studied two things. It's funny to be at a business school because this is what I actually studied. I studied the history of economics and cultural management on one hand. And on the other hand, I did uh, studies and a master's, de master's degree in uh, sound art and electroacoustic uh, music and contemporary composition. And both determined a little bit what I do today. Like I was quite... Uh, the, the, the experience at the business school gave me a very good tools to be able to kind of organize myself and manage myself and traveling around the world like this. It was uh, pretty handy to be able to do my own Excel sheets and budgets. So that was, that was something that got me. 
uh, got me on for a while. But what I started working with as soon as I entered the conservatory and a little bit before was an interest that I showed in electronic music and mainly like dance electronic music. So it was uh, I'm talking here about the period end of the 90s, 98, early 2000s when I arrived to France and uh, in Lebanon, I wasn't into music at all. I never imagined I would do music or be a musician or have anything to do with it. But getting to France, I found some th very interesting notion that was the record shop. <laughs> and this was the first time when I was able to buy vinyl and like to have turntables and to work with turntables and to touch uh, sound and the, uh, and, and the music. And actually, this is, how it, this, this is how things happened to me. I was in the city of Nantes, uh, 18 years old, and started buying records and wanting to DJ. And after a period of a year, I was like, okay, now I can put tracks together and sing, play them together, and I'm playing in raves and parties. But what after? So I started to uh, work more as a turntablist and use records, break them, uh, play them in backwards, use elastics and objects on the surface of the record player. And at some point, I moved to Reims, to Reims, to the business school, precisely, where I was about to uh, start another chapter of my studies and encountered the electroacoustic uh, music uh, conservatory and I did not know what electroacoustic music was so, so somebody told me oh if you're interested in records and doing all this you can enroll in this class and actually there you can have access to microphones and plug these to the turntables and record what you're doing so I was like okay I'll go check it out and, and this is how actually I fell into sound art and electroacoustics without knowing much about their history so it's kind of from praxis and practice that I got into the theoretical part and this approach has been ongoing actually in most of the things and the projects I've been doing so far and what I'm going to show you today. But I was quite close to, before, mu like before music I was interested by theater and before theater I was interested in literature but there was always this kind of stage component to what, what I was doing and to my practice. So you see from this uh, stage theater to the stage where the DJ plays to the concert space uh, when I entered the uh, kind of the academic uh, music uh, world of music, I was very much studying within the French uh, history of uh, electroacoustic music. I don't know if you know, like uh, the work of GRM and Pierre Schaeffer and Pierre Henri and like concrete sound and uh, field recordings and musique concrète. Uh, and also acousmatic uh, music in the sense of uh, Radio France and GRM where you have these big uh, concert uh, halls with sound in space and thinking the spatialization of sound and how sound can circulate and occupy space and at the same time influenced a lot by the early uh, emerging uh, real-time interactive techniques so works that institutions and foundations like IRCAM and STEIN uh, were uh, developing uh, at these periods and notably uh, interactive software and real-time software like Max MSP and Pure Data that at the time were uh, starting to become more and more powerful and uh, actually this is what I studied. So I um, studied computer programming to be able to make music and I was good in math and I was good in physics so it helped me a lot to catch up on lots of musical notions and the, the aspect of uh, writing uh, project specific software and being able to design my own tools according to sound ideas or comp compositional ideas I had took some time to do it took me several years to learn it but I always had in mind this intention of how can I bring this to life like how can uh, one be behind uh, on stage behind the laptop or behind the mixer uh, distributing sound in space or like playing a composition but to have a presence, you know, and not be the composer behind the laptop or who is kind of absorbed by his technique and technological environment and focusing on it and cut off from the audience or, or from the space or from listening to the whole uh, atmosphere or to, to, to the whole s s soundscape he was generating and creating and how this was affecting people's bodies and minds and presence and attention. So these were for me key elements in, in the work I, I was uh, trying to do. and. That, that's why I chose to start learning these programming techniques because they allowed me to create my tools and from learning the digital environments and th these uh, uh, computer languages, I made the backwards uh, trajectory of learning how to make instruments. So I, from digital, I went back to analog and all the things that I was programming virtually and in, in terms of abstraction, I could understand how 
uh, they would could be applied to making an electronic instrument such as synthesizer or be using transistors or using uh, capacitors and multiple sensors from this experience of working virtually. So usually people migrate from the analog to the digital and that's how historically things happen. In my case, everything had, has been always happening the other way around. And it had its uh, lots of disadvantages and was very tough in the beginning, but at some point it paid. And I, I'm happy I was patient with this uh, somehow and that I didn't quit. So the early things I, I built and I started developing were like interfaces uh, that uh, used very simple sensors like faders, rotators, uh, infrared and movement sensors. And that allowed me to make big tables of control, like, of, like to build instruments that were uh, made out of these components and of course a computer software part that was acting like the brain and channeling all the data that uh, my sensors sent to the to the computer and uh, i made big surfaces you see like for example compared to uh, the logic of the keyboard here for instance or to the logic of a lot of instruments today we try to maximize the number of commands and controls on a surface like this one by reducing sometimes the number of buttons, by uh, working on an, an ergonomy that makes the, the machine lighter, easier to carry. Um, uh, and yeah, that has, that has lots of practicalities to it. But I didn't like this idea of practicality, actually. That was very much influencing uh, design, like ideas of designing uh, m m musical instruments and, uh, uh, and interfaces. And I found a surface like this one to be, that is like super practical, to be very uh, inexpressive, you see. So kind of it, it, br it br brings us back to the same problematic that if you are using an instrument that is this size and being on stage, well, your, all your attention is going on this few square centimeters and you're forgetting about the, the, the total, uh, the, the, the whole landscape. And I felt quite disconnected when I was using these little interfaces and trying to play with them. So the idea came to blow up the surface. So instead of making a keyboard that is this size, I would make one that is the size of the table. And where, where typing two letters would sometimes necessitate running from one side of a table to another. So imagine like typing a paragraph or a sentence. It becomes, it becomes a performance on its own. In a way. And that was what's happening with my uh, early instruments and tools. So uh, this idea of using at my scale, like I have long arms, so the, the, the ambitus of the body and like of, of kind of liberating uh, the, the, the movement and the, the stretching it, kind of sometimes magnifying it to uh, exaggerated extremes. And also thinking how in building an instrument, uh, uh, one can balance different energies and parts of the body. So for, to give you an example, in building a surface like uh, like a controller, it was about using sometimes sensors uh, that worked with pressure and exerting force and counter counterbalancing those with sensors that used movement and uh, infrared so that did not rely on any force or any touch that were just relying on presence and uh, yeah uh, virtual movement. Uh, so you can you can see like when you are performing something like this, the body is constantly navigating between uh, extremes of putting weight, putting force, exerting force in one part, and the other one has to be loose and like very uh, decontracted and uh, uh, and fluid and versatile. And I was always balancing these different qualities wh while thinking an instrument. Like what impact would this instrument have on the body of the performer? In most cases, in the beginning, it was me and what expressivity com comes out of it. And little by little started to realize actually that in the act of performing with, in with interfaces and instruments like these, the body also becomes a sound actually. And like understanding the sound sometimes comes from reading the gestures or reading the, the physicality of the performer. And that with such approaches, there is like more a triangular process that starts to sh shape itself where the triangle is composed of the performer, the sound, and the uh, like uh, the, the sound slash composition and the instrument, and actually the three were uh, feeding uh, onto each other, and you don't know who is driving who. And in the process of working on a piece or preparing a performance, I started to move away from linear processes, ones where you f you would, for example, build an instrument. Uh, then uh, rehearse on it and then do a performance or one where you would start with a composition 
shift it to the computer and build its, uh, build a software for it and then rehearse with it. These ideas started a bit to collapse and the way I started to work was mixing those th three components at the same time. So starting an idea of design or like designing an instrument or an interface, listening to it, uh, trying playing it and having things unfold always from questioning the three aspects or navigating between the three summits of this uh, triangle. And that's what I kind of call the triangular approach that was for me much more interesting and uh, yeah, non-linear uh, and allowed a great deal of ex expressivity. And I, I'm sorry, I won't, I won't show you images of these uh, projects today because I'm gonna focus on something else. But what the early models I, I designed, and I don't have images of them actually, uh, I was in places in resi on residency in places like the United Arab Emirates where there is no electronic music shop. Uh, and uh, I ended up building them on foam. Uh, like, you know, I went to kids' uh, toy stores. Like, I, lots of times when I'm looking for ideas to hack or like solutions that are cheap and carryable, I go to toy stores and I find lots of materials and matters there. And some of the stuff I found were like, you know, these kind of Lego puzzles with which you make a floor on, uh, in a kindergarten with numbers and letters. You see these like kind of uh, colored, uh, 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 pieces of foam, and so I used those and mounted the sensors on them, and that it was very, uh, it was a smart idea because then it was like an open casing type of instrument and quite light and easy to travel with, and if things would break, I could change them on the spot and they could they would break often, but the, the instrument had no sacrality to it in a way, and it allowed me to travel to a lot of places like this. You see, they all could fit in one suitcase and it would all be very easy to deploy, on the table uh, on the surface and uh, to hook up to a sound system and it's like almost like a kind of plug and play approach to, to performing sound. And it was very helpful in terms of working in outdoor spaces or in places that were not the usual concert space or the typical listening space in which uh, music intervention of that sort usually happens. So my practice shifted to uh, occupying lots of outdoor spaces and to taking like roundabouts, parking lots, uh, uh, squ uh, public squares uh, as, uh, as stages and uh, going to encounter people who would not usually come to this type of performances. And uh, the discussion that followed after and the, the impacts that these approaches had, this approach of working with the public, the public realm <coughs> was very liberating to me. Liberating in the sense that, um, as coming again from musique savant, like the French musique savant and the tradition of the concert space and the acousmonium and the multi-channel and these, what today I find like super luxurious ways to present sound, uh, the idea of being outdoor and in uh, public spaces and with audiences that are not used to this brought me to question the essence of what I was doing. So no need to have any more uh, 8, 16, 32 channels, maybe just one channel. If two is two channels is good, one channel is okay. We can also play with one channel. That's, it wasn't what was important. Um, also, uh, yeah, like the, the ideas of light, of, of all this scenery and stagery became less and less, uh, mattered less and less. When what, what was really mat interesting for me was to create these listening spaces or these shared collective spaces in a way. And uh, this is something that stayed with me and influenced my work a lot. So from working in solo and traveling like this with these early electronic instruments and interfaces I built, I started little by little to shift from the computer, the software, uh, the, mo the uh, uh, modular way of programming computer software also. Like I was working with a lot of modules that I built and then assemble inside the bigger software and it makes like a, a meta uh, tool to, to perform. Uh, these things I started to apply to human beings. So uh, imagine in a way like I was looking for a long uh, while working with uh, uh, chance and hazard and uh, random algorithm and trying to control chance in terms of like uh, having unpredictability in uh, things I create and play and allowing like me to improvise. But after doing this for a long, long time, I discovered that actually the best thing to have is a human being. It's much more unpredictable than an algorithm and it's much more uh, 
fun and exciting <laughs> in a certain way. But I kept, of course, the, the algorithmic approach. But the collaboration with uh, musicians and opening my concepts and ideas to other people and involving other people started to emerge. And so in this, uh, what I'm going to start showing you now, what I, what, I, what I'll start showing you now, I'll take you on a walk through different of these collaborative projects and uh, tell you a little bit about their backgrounds each time, but also what they allowed uh, in terms of uh, create, what spaces they created, spaces of uh, like what social spaces, what collaborative spaces, what uh, um, backgrounds they offer to the different practitioners and people I was working with and inviting. So uh, the first thing I'll show you here is a project called, uh, in, this, uh, in this direction, uh, it's a project called On and From Tarab, and it had different names at uh, different parts of its uh, history. But the idea of it was something, well, actually this project started with me at some point questioning what, uh, why I don't know anything about uh, classical Arabic music, you see. Like, I knew a lot about uh, Western classical music. I knew more about contemporary, uh, uh, Western contemporary music, and that's how, actually, I learned classical, Western classical music, but nothing about Arabic music. And uh, when I had this question, somebody said, well, why don't you go see uh, Amar Foundation and uh, a man in Lebanon, in the mountain of Lebanon, called Kamal uh, Assar, and he's the biggest collector in the world of music from this era. He's got the first discs ever recorded in Arabic, and uh, his, uh, his work and his foundation are uh, into uh, digitizing and like preserving the whole heritage of this period. Like classical Arabic music is the music of the period that goes from late 19th century till the 1940s. It's what we call in Arabic the Nahda period, where like the Ottoman Empire crumbled, the uh, uh, culture uh, reappeared again after like five centuries of uh, uh, cultural oppression that the Ottoman exerced on the Arab, uh, different parts of the Arab world. And it's actually the music of the Levant that we are talking about. So like the music of uh, Egypt, Palestine, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iraq is different, Turkey is a whole different story, but it, it's, it's a music that was specific to these, uh, to these places. And in this period, like a lot of recording happened, a lot of uh, poetry was, uh, was written, uh, opera houses opened, and music started to, be, to go outside of the courtyards and like the uh, aristocratic places where it was uh, usually performed. So uh, we started to have like genres like the cabaret genre in Cairo, we started to have uh, uh, sheikhs and religious people also like uh, performing music after doing the prayer inside mosques. It was, it was an extremely rich and vivid, lively period that died in the 40s, unfortunately, for many reasons. But what I did on this project was then uh, trying to try to ask uh, what, uh, what, do we, what do we learn from this music today, you see? What, what's the heritage of this music? And where, did it, uh, where, is it taking, uh, where, where is it taking us to? And so I started to invite, like my idea in this uh, Tarab project was, a, was an invitation I made to about 30 musicians from all genres. So like from uh, noise music, to free jazz, to contemporary music, to hip hop, to uh, popular uh, electronic dance, to, uh, to traditional musicians, and who came from Japan, South Africa, uh, you name it, like really from all over the place. It's like I took my list of favorite musicians and sent an invitation like this, saying, okay, maybe some people will respond. And actually a lot of people responded and the invitation was about having them in Lebanon come to Kamal's place where the archive is uh, stored and to spend a week each uh, one by one talking to ethnomusicologists, listening to uh, musicians who play this tradition because few musicians play uh, classical Arabic music today. And uh, yeah, dive for a little while into the archive and to what Kamal uh, was working on. And from this archive, after a week, they could leave with uh, musics. They would ask. They would ask us to digitize, digitize for them. So, we could, we would uh, take. They would take pieces uh, and go back to their studio. And what I ask them each uh, uh, one individually is to uh, make a piece that is 15 to 20 minutes long, and. Uh, 
sampling, uh, retranscribing, using whatever technique they wanted, using this material from the archive in whatever way that suited their work methods, and then re-invited everybody at three different at three moments and occasions for a collective performance, which parameters of space, duration, uh, improvisation, collaboration were all deriving and coming from classical Arabic music. So, for example, I show you here the first space that was done, the first iteration of this project in 2011 in New York at Performa. And the idea here was to have, as you can see, this big carpet space where people could lie down and sit, a few chairs in the back for those uh, who are not comfortable on the ground. but. Uh, and then a stage that is very slightly elevated, like the traditional Arabic uh, music stage, where you would be very close from the audience, and a performance that was six hours long, actually, and where the musicians played their solo pieces, but also, uh, but also had moments where they improvised all together and collaborated, uh, and collaborated, yes, and worked all together in, uh, uh, in sections and segments I had uh, thought about and uh, written previously. That's just an example from uh, Sarah, Zina, uh, Sarah and Zina Parkins, uh, along with Ikwe Mori. And this is an, ex an excerpt from Zina's piece, where she took uh, just a theme that she found in the collection and then rewrote a whole different uh, uh, piece uh, from it. But so yes, that's, that was the first uh, experience. And the second time I did it, it was in Sharjah, in the United Arab Emirates. And here we took a whole square, actually. Uh, and the same thing, we unfolded a situation that lasted several hours, but where sound and was placed differently. And we used the acoustic of this uh, traditional uh, courtyard to create like massive sound, where the, every time the idea was also to see how we can reach like a form of uh, tarab is trance in, in uh, uh, Arabic, is a, is a special trance induced by music in Arabic culture. And the idea was to see how we can reproduce this trance uh, with noise, with the aesthetics of Japanese noise music or with the aesthetics of uh, uh, improvised music. And so the space this created was like uh, always like a, a collective space where we were looking for, the proxim uh, for proximity with the audience, where we were um, also like uh, trying to work with duration in different ways. But maybe the time where this culminated and got to an interesting point is, was at the Serpentine in London in 2012, actually. And that was uh, at the, for the occasion of the marathon. And what we did here was like build, uh, there was a dome that was in the park outside of the Serpentine. And the evening again was like super long. But the principle of it was that uh, on this performance, what I did was something that, I, that uh, also came from cl classical Arabic music, was to invite, uh, was to have envelopes, actually. Like, the score of the evening was in different envelopes that uh, the performers did not know about. They were all sitting next to the stage during the performance. And every time the script or the score inside an envelope was about to finish, I would choose one uh, and give it to the musicians. And I was not constantly like going from the stage to the audience and paying attention to the overall situation. Yes, this is the, the space of the, of the performance. Uh, and listening to how things were happening inside uh, and deciding what scenario I would open and give to the musicians. And this, had, th this for me was the closest maybe to the ideas of working on Tarab and working on improvisation and creating like a thread and tension in, in the space that was uh, uh, created where the audience could feel, could feel that there is really something at stake being played and everybody was super attentive performance, performers also. And it's something that was very different from if you do a performance that is six hours long with 20, 25 musicians, 
you would have a lot of them sitting in the green room and waiting for their turn. They're like, oh, just tell me when I play and I'll be there. If you want me at 11, I'll be at 11. If you want me at midnight, I'll be there. But uh, where is the green room? And this time I was like, there is no green room. There is, uh, if you want a drink, you can go there. If you want to go to the toilet, it's just behind. But the rest of the time you're sitting like you are now and waiting for your turn. <laughs> and it, was, it was great, like really, like every, every, we, we all lived it like a magical moment. And it was one of the strongest moments uh, of uh, concerts that, uh, that I did. But yes, that's, that's, uh, that, that was one of the early spaces, like collective, co cooperative, collaborative spaces I started to create through a project like this. And then another time I got to do an, uh, uh, one of the major things I got to do in, the, in this sense of uh, collaborative uh, uh, big scale uh, projects was something that uh, started at the uh, Berlin Biennale, uh, 8th Berlin Biennial in 2014, and I where I was members of the artistic committee. And actually, as a member of the artistic committee, I was invited to go visit the Anthropological Museum of Dahlem. Uh, there it is here, Dahlem, in Berlin. And in their anthropology, uh, in their storage, in the storage of this museum, I found a huge collection of instruments that you can see. Some are here in these vitrines, others are in, on the floor, some are on shelves and inside cupboards. And they have no indications about how old they are, their origin, when they entered the collection, how they were played. It's a storage. They just had a serial number that referred to the archive. And in the archive were, this, were these information. But in this situation of storage, there was a very interesting uh, thing happening, is that these instruments kind of lost their social cultural parameters, actually. And like we were just left with the, with the fact that these are sound producing machines. And that's the only certainty we have, we had. But this disappearance of uh, social cultural parameters kind of allowed a new story to start with these instruments. And therefore, I had this ambitious idea of asking the conservators at the museum if it was possible to play these instruments and to invite improvisers to come and play on these. And of course, the, the, the answer was, no, you can't. Uh, and for a very simple reason is that these instruments are now part of a collection, that they got preserved, and that instruments inside anthropology or instrument museums or ethnographic collections, they stop sounding and producing sound. They are more preserved for ethnomusicologists to study them and for audiences to look at them. And if you want to have the sound of these instruments, if, if you want to have these instruments sound again, you would have to make a replica by studying the original one and play, play on the replica. But here the idea like I had was like, well, wh why not try to make a replica in a different way? Anyways, it's, it didn't happen like this. So what, we had a very long discussion with the, with the team of uh, the museum and was like, okay, but you have 2,000 instruments. I'm sure there are some we can play. Um, I was highly recommended by the Biennale and they, the museum and the Biennale wanted to collaborate. So everyone was like, yeah, you should try and help Tare. So they, they listened to me and like, in the end, we ended up uh, like hiring, a, not hiring, but nominating a committee who went through all these instruments and said, OK, these are the ones you can play. And you can play them under this and that condition. Like, for example, you can uh, play a string instrument, but you cannot tune the strings. Like, you cannot exert tension on the strings. So if the strings are totally loose, it's your problem. Uh, you, you want to play a drum, the same thing. You cannot st stretch the skin. If the skin is loose, you have to figure out. Some instruments were inside these uh, cupboards, for example, like, oh, no, this is very fragile. It cannot come out. You have to go into the cupboard. Then. <laughs> okay. So we, we did lots of things like these. And, in, 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 and it was super, because when you, maybe some of you here are familiar with improvisation and working with uh, improvisation, you always need constraints for an improvisation to happen, or rules, or like uh, parameters, you see. And the parameters here were coming from the discussion and the conversation and the reality of these instruments being collected uh, items inside the uh, anthropology museum and, uh, and storage. And in some cases, also, we wore gloves. In some cases, we put uh, plastic as mouth protection uh, because uh, the, the instruments were chemically treated. And over six months, I invited like this. I had the pleasure to work with uh, 16 musicians, eight percussionists, eight uh, wind uh, instruments, and eight 
strings, but who all came from improvised music and from extended technique. Do you know what is extended technique? No. Extended technique is, uh, is something that started uh, with John Cage's prepared piano, if we would like to give it a historical moment, when uh, you would extend the existing technique of playing an instrument. So for example, you would play percussion on a wind instrument, or where, where you would bow on a percussion instrument, or you would start using, like with instruments, you all know we have three families, percussion, wind, and strings. And so extended technique is about using the uh, uh, techniques from the three families applied to one instrument. And the musicians I invited were all very skilled in uh, yeah, combining multiple techniques and found objects and added objects onto an instrument. So they were not afraid of finding themselves confronted to, uh, to uh, an instrument or a sound machine they knew nothing about. And when I invited them to the museum, I specifically asked them not to go into the archive and read about the instruments or find out more about where they came from, their age or anything, but just to interact with them intuitively in that storage at this moment. And I'll show you here a few of uh, the recording sessions that happened in the museum at that time. And so like this, there were like 150 instruments recorded and like a huge database that was uh, collected over time of people playing in solo. But after this moment, what, what happened after like six months of uh, working uh, 
individually with the musicians inside the storage, uh, ideas of uh, scores, of uh, textures, of uh, situations, of several musicians coming and playing together started to, uh, to, to come to mind. And so for the opening of the Biennale, what happened is that I uh, organized a series of concerts that took place inside the museum and on which um, this time several musicians, 12, 12 musicians came together and performed uh, on the instruments they had previously recorded on. Sorry, I'll start just playing uh, less things so I manage the time properly. But so what happened here also was like these series of concerts where uh, that all got recorded in uh, video and audio, but the project did not end here. So following this uh, intervention at the Berlin Biennale and these series of uh, recordings and performances, I took sections of these concerts, like not all of them because it was they were several hours long and over several days, but I kept like an hour more or less of six hours of improvisations that happened in the museum. And uh, these, this hour, was, I, I took like seven or eight uh, moments of uh, performance and just took the audio recordings and then started to look for instrument makers to collaborate with. And the idea behind this was to find instrument makers who would um, uh, who would just listen to the material of the performances and try to imagine the instruments that were inside. And from listening just to the sound, rebuild the instruments that they could hear inside these uh, audio material I was sharing with them. And so again, for like several months, I think about six instrument makers from different specialties, some working with strings, some working with air, some working with um, mi mixed techniques, uh, took on the, the, the mission of drawing, sketching for at first, like the, the, the machines and instruments they imagined inside um, my, uh, uh, my Dalem uh, uh, excerpts. And like this, I rebuilt the collection of the Anthropology Museum, uh, redid like another uh, collection of instruments based on people who listened to uh, the sounds of uh, the Dalim performances. And so these are some of the instruments that then uh, came as a result of this work period. I'll show, I'll show them to you very quickly. Um, and then I'll show you some videos.
I'll try and show you also the whole space. Uh, this is another one. This is another one. It looks like this. And the whole installation space. Yes. Looked like that. So that's that's these are uh, image captures from the exhibition as it took uh, as it happened at the Tate Modern, like three years ago now, when they opened the new spaces and the tank uh, spaces, and that's inside the tanks where all these instruments came together. First time I showed them was uh, with in Mexico with one of my galleries, Kuri Monzuto. Uh, and this is this. This was the second iteration of the project, actually, and that's that's for me a very that was for me a very interesting type of space and situation that unfolded from there. As I told you, we spent several months inside the uh, uh, anthropology museum, recording, then performing, then several months again with all these instrument makers building these pieces in different workshops and parts of the and parts of the world and yeah it was a, a lot of travel to work sometimes all, even with craftsmen in china like the the ceramicists who did these pieces uh and it wasn't just um, instrument makers uh, per se but like yeah some in some cases the profiles of the people were very different but the story for me like that all this that this is a lot a huge preparation work for a moment that was very important is when these pieces arrived to the Tate Modern inside the tank and when the story started to unfold. So in a way, even like at the Kuri Manzuto Gallery, when I did it, I can maybe show you uh, images of it there as well. Yes, this was the first time I, I showed it in, in uh, Kuri Manzuto, at Kuri Manzuto, but the the real pleasure and the the, the 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 real moment of where all this took uh uh meaning in the begin uh, like at uh, in the early stages was when these instruments arrived to the space and then it was about installing them in the space having them all sound between them and then inviting another uh series of musicians and performers to activate those and play with those, to continue the story and the sound of these instruments in the, in the Anthropology Museum. Because the way I saw it is that the sound of these instruments is, is an extension and a continuation, if you, if you want to say it, a real continuation of the sound of these uh, instru silent instruments in the collection now. And so at the Tate Modern, the way things happened is that it was very hard to make a floor plan or to tell the technical team, OK, we put this here, we put that here, we're going to do it like this. The approach was much more about saying, OK, bring all the crates, bring all these things, put them in the middle of the, of the space, and let's start opening the crates and the boxes one by one and uh, turn on the instruments and see how they work and then figure out where, which part of the space they would occupy. And the shape of the exhibition that you see now was the result of a very open installation uh, process that for me was a compositional process on which the shape of the installation and its occupation of space and uh, the relation between its, its instruments came from the act of listening and uh, uh, being very attentive to sound. And then came the idea of OK, how do we invite people to a situation like this one or to a space like that one? Uh, of course, again, the idea was to invite musicians who work with improvisation, who are good with extended techniques. But the modalities of their work, like this is a museum uh, to, that was at that time in these circumstances, new space, new building, was extremely visited, like had high uh, rates of affluence and of visitors per day. Uh, in which we wanted to make performances uh, with like new instruments and where maybe people would be just passing by, like people are not necessarily expecting to come see a concert or a performance inside a space like this. They're more coming to see artwork, uh, maybe watch a film, <coughs> but if they encounter a concert happening, they might not stay. They might stay for five minutes, 10 minutes, and this is the time that they have to dedicate to a piece like this. Rare are those who encounter something similar to inside the museum and decide to stay for an hour. I saw it happen, but it's not something that I, it's an exception actually. Uh, and it was something quite delicate and difficult. How do you invite musicians who are used to being on stage, who are used to having people come to listen to them and to give them their time and attention for a period of half an hour, an hour, whatever the concert lasts. Um, yes, how can, uh, 
a practice like this shift to a space like that and uh, not be uh, affected uh, and of course it's going to be affected but where musicians also still felt comfortable and still felt that this is uh, a productive space and so lots of ideas came of what are the parameters to work inside here you see and um, to give you some examples uh, I asked the musicians never to play more than 15 minutes in a row so for instance uh, pieces of 15 minutes followed by a break of 5-10 minutes musicians talk we talk among us plan the uh, section afterwards, like we would say, okay, I'll play on this instrument with the black tubes, you'll play on the one with this, uh, like on the uh, kind of hurdy-gurdy violin, uh, you'll play on the stones, and then we will shift, and we would like make simple scripts like these uh, and execute them uh, and reduce the format. And that's that's one, one thing that responded to the reality of this space. Don't play a long piece because nobody will Anyways, hear it from beginning to end. Don't plan a beginning and an end. Just consider it as an open-ended session. Uh, also, don't look for people's gaze. Like when you are playing and performing, don't try to hold on to the audience, but more relate to each other. And just make abstraction of people's movements and flow inside the space and relate to you as musicians and to the, uh, to the instruments. And I'll show you maybe here while I'm talking about all this. Some yeah, maybe I show you this quickly. That's an extract, and again, you can imagine here the amount of footage. Okay, I'll just these roll when I while while I talk. Hello. And so, yeah. So th those were some of the instructions. Like, don't relate to the audience. Don't. Um, don't play long when you move in the space uh, when you switch from one instrument to the other always take some time to think what is the step after don't just move erratically from one instrument to the other so very simple indications i never told people what to do or what to perform or on what to play it was just telling giving them simple indications that made their life easier in in this type of context and the very nice part in this is that what we did was to work with a music coordinator called Eric Namur, who uh, now lives in Mexico, but used to be, works in London and used to be like a festival uh, director and programmer in, in London of uh, new music. And Eric uh, sent me a list of 40 musicians who could, uh, who would like to work with the project and who would be good to invite on this project. And they were all from London. And what we did was, okay, say, we, we invited uh, all, these, uh, all these people and what we had is like a kind of Google Calendar actually to which, in which every musician put his, uh, his or her availabilities to say, oh, I'm free to play on Friday at uh, 3 p.m. and I'm free to play on uh, Saturday at 4 and I, I have uh, two hours between two rehearsals and I'm uh, close to Tate so I can pass by. And actually what started to happen was really nice is that musicians would come sometimes with their cello or like with their instrument, put it uh, here behind the wall, uh, to the back of the wall, enter the space, play and leave. And so these like kind of pop-up performances happen uh, like uh, 
hap uh, happenings, kind of not happening, sort of happenings, were taking place a bit sometimes spontaneously and like by, by themselves actually with this community of musicians appropriating the work and like kind of integrating it into their daily and professional life. So. Uh, W there were moments that were not overly planned in terms of how this space can be occupied and and brought to life but this was one modality like this this is like the what i called the kind of improvising within an exhibition context uh, or performing within an exhibition context and yes here also there is like these are the technicians of tate who are at some point were also playing with us because they did music on uh, uh, uh outside of uh, being technicians at tate and so um the, uh, what I was saying here is that uh, this there was this spontaneity spontaneity in the format of uh, concerts inside the exhibition uh, performances inside the exhibition space but there were also moments where we commissioned composers to work with uh, to create pieces for this ensemble of instruments and the idea here was very different like a commission for a composer would be that the composer can then invite X number of musicians to work with him, can choose to write a piece that is uh, durational or, and that, and which presentation and uh, um, would happen outside of the opening hours of the museum. So it's a moment of concert, like that is really a concert where we put chairs in the space, where the people who come come to listen to John Butcher's piece, come to listen to uh, Thierry Madiot's piece, and uh, and yes, and th th that was much more closer to a concert format. And the, the activation of uh, the piece at, at the Tate was constantly balancing between these pop-up performances and events and these uh, moments of commissions and com like composed pieces. And so it's like a balance also that was for me very nice between improvised moments and written composed moments. And so yes, the space it created was great from a perspective from the perspective of practitioners and musicians because it was like this kind of open platform to which like you could come and uh, in which you could come and do things when you had the time to do so and uh, also what was very nice for for this audience or community of musicians is that for them the idea or the fact of being uh, in touch with an instrument uh, that was new to them or that was uh, very unfamiliar was also very refreshing for their attention, for uh, like reconnected them to other dimensions of listening, of paying attention to the body, of uh, kind of reconsidering certain notions that we tend to forget when we become virtuosos on one instrument. You see, when you are very good at playing the cello, you take for granted, that, not for granted, but you are very familiar with how you use the bow. You don't question how you're holding a bow or the force you're exercising with the bow because it it's becomes part of your vocabulary. But here, like if you hold a bow and play it on a stone, it's a totally different story. See, and your your uh, relationship with the bow is reset by this new instrument that you are being confronted with. So that's that's the type of space. The reverse. This project is called all in all the reverse collection. And uh, yes, the type of space is it created is this is this one where still the musicians who were working in it were kind of virtuosos, or even the instruments that were created and developed for it required some kind of virtuosity. Like an amateur cannot come and play on these instruments. They are not designed for amateurs or unexperienced people to play. So I was still here in, within the realm of uh, professional musicians um, uh, and working with professional musicians. So fine. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. Um, I just want to ask about the um, the Dalem solo sessions. Yes. Um, you said there was a lot of material produced. Yes. Did that go? Did that sort of become a new archive? Yes. For, you know, historians who are interested. In yes. Uh, it it became like what what happened with this like it's as I said like hours and hours of recordings and tracks uh, that were shared with all the musicians on the project. So it was like a, like, it's not an archive, it's more like a database or a collection of sounds. You see? So, and it was given to the museum, of course, but the nice thing is that a lot of the musicians on the project used it for their own compositions. So I sometimes even, I once went to, to, to see a film uh, done by one of uh, my colleague musicians <coughs> and I heard his solos in Dalem and other solos. So no, the, these sounds had a life parallel to the project and that's, uh, often what happens uh, with 
ideas like those. But I did not put it online for people to download. It, it remained like within the, uh, the participants to the project. Yes? Um, on the exhibition, I noticed that it was surrounded by concrete. Yes. Did that affect the sound um, in a negative way or a positive mm. way? Yeah. Yeah, well, at, at the Tate, uh, the, thing, the thing to know is that these tank spaces are thought as performance and sound, sound and performance spaces. So despite the concrete, you can see here in the roof, like, like the structure have been like super isolated and done in a way that this would, this would have been or used to be a very reverberant space, very echoey and very refractive with the, with the concrete. But here it was tamed and it was done in a way that was uh, really adapted to projects like these. And in my practice in general, I, I don't care, honestly. You see, I've worked in a lot of, in a lot of situations where the sound, where the spaces were reverberant, uh, lively, uh, uh, had noise or impurity in them, and I used it and I worked with it. You see, I don't like to alter the spaces a lot, like to put curtains and absorbing panels and drapes and, uh, no, like I, I, I like the acoustic quality of spaces the way they are. Thank you. Okay, so I'll continue and maybe here to, to also uh, answer the first question I had in regards to the sounds that were produced from the solos. The same logic that is applied to the sounds is actually also applied to the instruments. Like in my agreement and my contract with the instrument makers is that the authorship of the idea and like of the instrument that is done is the instrument makers, it's not mine. My project is not making an instrument, it is making all this happen. And the instrument is a tool or part of it or the medium that it's using for the execution of the idea, but not a finality. And that the instrument maker could reproduce the instrument he did for me as much as he wanted and sell it to other musicians if he want. And so uh, not all of those, because some are quite heavy and big and not practical for, mus for musicians to carry around, but the small ones like some like some instruments got so far replicated more than 30 times and people bought them and like play them and yeah but this is not something that i uh, uh that i did or like consider it's, it's a fractal aspect of of my of the practice you see and something that i'm keen on giving uh um uh infrastructure for but it's not like my, my work the, yes so i didn't mean to interrupt no 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 have, have you got any more Uh, in terms of uh, sound? Well, this is what will come uh, in a few months here, so you will be able to listen to them <laughs> one by one <laughs> soon enough here. But unfortunately, in my database uh, now, no, and to be honest with you, these types of projects generate so much <laughs> that I, I'm still going into the archive and like digging all these things uh, until today. But, uh, but yes, I'll, I'll tell you... Uh, uh, about the project here, and you'll see a lot of them will be coming uh, to. Uh, of what they do, sure, sure. Okay, up, uh, what shall I describe to you? Like this, 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 for example, this, these three horns are connected to an air compressor, and the way to play them is, let me try to find details, yes is you see here you have balloons, like real uh, small balloons that are uh, taped to uh, a beer, a bottle of beer. And so the balloon sticks to the bottle, uh, to the neck of the bottle. And with air being flown, when you press on the balloon, you make like amazing horn sounds, but just by, mod by kind of rubbing the hand on the surface of the, uh, uh, of the balloon. And so you play them by, by touch and you can see like how focused the people are in playing them but they sound like Alpine or Tibetan horns, uh, but with a very wide range, because the more you press, the higher the pitch and the stronger the, the pressure you see. And um, with, uh, let's say, I'll just take some elements. Like these are simply stones, lithophones, and they, they, they have the, uh, particularity of being played with uh, sticks that are made of cow bone. So the sticks are made of uh, bone and like bone and stone sound really, really amazing. Like it's prehistoric technique, but uh, yeah, the best uh, mallet to hit a stone with is bone. Um, 
in up oh, let's do like this what is this more stones no this is an instrument that will uh, that will also come uh, come here like those are five long horns but actually they are just plastic tubes uh, they are the, the, the made out of the plastic that you uh, uh, certain uh, factories and companies use for making forks and knives and uh, so it's this uh, type of plastic and when you unroll them they become like these uh, big uh, big horns and again they are connected uh, here through to uh, an air compressor and the air compressor sends with these uh, faucets here you can control the pressures in, in all of those and the rays at the end of the horns are balloons and on these balloons you can place different objects like these balls and sponges and you can control like the airflow and create timbers that are very specific uh, and like noisy textural but also can be super powerful this instrument by the way is called the, the horns of putin so <laughs> which i really like as title um what else so yeah no like this like th th there are multiple examples and really in the project that will come here you will yeah you will see a lot of those but i'm i just want to show you a last thing and the last type of space uh, now that's a project I can spend a lot a lot of time uh, <laughs> describing and talking about but I'll just uh, yeah I'll maybe do it backwards and play this footage for you
<laughs> okay, I'll maybe stop here because it's also well, to tell you what's what's happening in this situation, actually, this this project is called Within, and uh, Within is again a project that took me years to do, and I'm still developing, and it's is partly coming here for the exhibition within uh, the festival. But Within is a project that considers deafness as an expertise and not as a handicap, and that like from this uh, approach, uh, actually, deafness. Uh, like I, I, I look into deafness as a way that can really inspire us and have us revisit the ways we do music, uh, make instruments, uh, collaborate, improvise, and play together. The role of the conductor, the role of the arranger, the mixer, all these components in the music industry and music making are revisited from a deaf perspective. And what's happening on this performance, and that's a piece by Pauline Oliveros that was for the opening of the Bergen Assembly in 2016, where I was artistic director, the conductor is profoundly deaf. Robert Demeter doesn't hear anything at all. Uh, he's a painter, and he is conducting here an ensemble of professional musicians joined by deaf musicians, and it is uh, like uh, the core of this project. So Robert spent uh, days working with the, with the instruments that we see here, uh, and created this piece with Pauline where he developed his own language to conduct the ensemble and to give instructions to the musicians, whether they are hearing or deaf. And the instruments that are being played are the result of years of research, of me going into universities like Berkeley, uh, to uh, sound uh, institutions like IRCAM or uh, the Electronic Music Studio of Stockholm, or working with educators who work with deaf audiences in cultural centers and art uh, 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 organizations to working with sound artists who had experiences working with deaf people and to me also going into high schools that mix deaf and hearing audiences uh, students together and every time I went to one of these places I asked the people there what is an instrument that deaf and hearing people can play and perceive and so the, this, the, the answers were numerous some came up with ideas of percussion instruments like the one, one you see here or the one you see here Others came up with ideas of resonating objects in metal that vibrate when you touch them and hold them and where you can feel the sound in the, in the body. Others came with ideas of drums like these where you, ha you have the movement of the marbles become sound and like you can guess the sound from watching the marbles move and uh, seeing them bouncing and reflecting on the surface of the drum uh, to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to ones who worked on these up, oh. Ideas of tactile pianos. Oh, pa, 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 where is he? Where is he? Oh, there he is. Of ideas of like tactile pianos that play sounds of a city that uh, was recorded by deaf people and where deaf people matched the vibration, the sensation of the vibration of the sound to the touch of the textiles. Uh, two instruments where. Uh, well, uh, yes, where here you could draw with, with a special ink any drawing and then play it, uh, like play it with a, uh, it's an instrument where you, where you draw something and then you play the drawing by sitting on a synthesizer and a speaker that is here. So it's like a bass synthesizer that is activated via drawing and touch. And the, it's, it's an ensemble of instruments that has in it like 15, 16 pieces now, all different from each other. And the first time all these instruments came together was in this uh, at the Bergen Assembly in this uh, swimming pool. I'll show you some images. And actually, what we did in this space was that, whoop, let me see. Yeah, what we did in this uh, abandoned swimming pool that was in the in the downtown of the city of Bergen in Norway was that we you can see it. Uh, yeah, you can see it here. You see, like the diving, the diving, the slope of the pool. We made it into a stage. We put the instruments inside the swimming pool spit, but also around. Like there are instruments we don't see in the photos that are placed in the at the corners of the pool, and sound is inside, outside, and it's like the water was taken out from the pool and we added sound into it. And sound here in, on this project is not just sound through the ears. It's sound through the body, sound that you can feel sometimes as bass, 
but also sound that you can listen to with the hands, sound that you can feel as touch, sound that you can see, as I was telling you with these marbles, so sound as movement. It is also sound as body expression, sign language, uh, 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 the expressivity of sign language. All this on this project is sound, and the situations we were deploying and uh, experimenting with on these uh, on this project are listening situations that are, can be concerts, uh, uh, listening sessions, whatever. But that mobilize all these aspects of uh, listening revisited from a deaf uh, from deaf people's perspective. And this the space of the swimming pool is something is an experiment I was really happy with because what uh, what it offered is uh, uh, is the possibility for collaboration between deaf and hearing people and the modalities of this space were quite uh, open in the sense that actually here in Bergen there were like about 70, 80 musicians, professionals, non-professionals, young, old, deaf, hearing with all degrees of deafness from totally deaf to partially deaf to people with cochlear implant or hearing aids. Um, and if you were one of these 80 musicians, you could come at any time into the pool and play. So if you want to rehearse, if you want to train, if you want to record, if you want to try, the, the floor was open for the musicians who had enrolled to the project to enter it and go inside and do things. And at the same time, inside this space, like I was like some of my assistants and people who had worked with me turned out to be very good mediators and they were also like sitting in the pool sometimes playing themselves and that was their internship to be playing sound and when people come to the exhibition they would talk to them tell them what this is uh, we didn't use a lot of uh, speech we more used uh, playing and sound to communicate with people so if you would come and ask me what is this instrument instead of telling you seven paragraphs I would take you and play it um, and so it was like a very, very exper experiential space, inside, and inside of which, uh, here, it wasn't the public of virtuosos, it wasn't the public of experts, it was a very open public. And again, composers were invited every week to create a piece and rehearse with uh, seven to 10 of the musicians that were taking part of the project. And in this way, like this place was habited and came to life a bit, uh, yeah, in a very natural way that was not forced, that was that didn't feel very uh, uh, compelling, you know, and very restrictive to people, and where we had a lot of uh, sessions of rehearsals, discoveries, workshops, you name it, like a lot of things unfolded from from these situations, and notably, let me see. Yeah, moments where like uh, members from the deaf community of Bergen, um, from the music scene of jazz, of uh, contemporary music, of all this would come and uh, yeah have access to discovery sessions. They try the instruments and then they decide if they want to be part of the process or not. We had sign language translation, of course, all the time, but at some point we didn't even need it because we were just after like a few weeks of working together. Uh, communication wasn't happening anymore through uh, uh, the barrier, actually, a uh, psychological barrier of being deaf and non-deaf was uh, overcome. And uh, and yes, like a, a space like this one generated lots of uh, ripples in the city. And like, yeah, you could see like uh, in a way that the opening concerts and the performances were super well attended. And in the end, like the finale was yeah, like I think two two percent of the city's population inside the swimming pool, and like wow, it was like a big mess, but nice. <laughs> so yes, that's 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 another case of uh, of a space or like a situation that the project of mine created uh, and how it got activated and where notions of performance, medi mediation, invigilator. Uh, got all scrambled together. Like the, 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 the musician is mediator, the mediator is at another moment uh, performer, the, the, the composer can perform. Um, I was myself sometimes the composer, sometimes the artistic director, sometimes the technician, sometimes the facilitator. Um, and I like a lot these uh, formats where people can have different roles or take on different responsibilities according to their desires and motivations and ambitions. And it's actually along these lines now that the project here uh, 
uh, at the festival is going to happen. Do you have any questions before I tell you what this project is? Please. Okay, I hope this isn't too flippant. It is just, um, I, I liked it when, you, particularly when you started to talk about the very beginning of that um, body being part of performance. Yes. And, and I can really see when you move on to work with deaf people, there's a, there's a really good connection with that. But I just wonder if you see a lot of people wearing dark <coughs> or black clothes in yeah. the room, if that's a sort of denial of them. Yes. Well, that's honestly in this video, that's the aesthetics of a contemporary music ensemble. And I was not happy about it. <laughs> no, I, I was, but no, I, I, but I accepted it. I'll tell you why. I, that's, that's their code that even the, like the, it's not my piece, it's Pauline's, Pauline Oliveros piece. And Pauline was very sensitive to also their desire. So she let them wear black because they always wear black. But even the amateur deaf people who were part of it were also wearing black. So you don't know who is who after a while. But the good thing with black is that uh, in deaf culture, you see the hands better. So for people like, for like translators or like, the, if, if, I don't know if you know, they tend to wear dark colors so you see the hands clearly. And I accepted it from this approach. I said, okay, fine, it's, it, it, you can still see the movement. Well, on this project where I, saw you, I showed you the images in colors, the space is saturated with light, for, for example. The lights are never dim. Because we want movement to be clear, we want bodies to be clear. We don't want to create this kind of dimmed down uh, atmosphere where, like, yeah, um, no, like it's uh, the, it was the opposite, and that this was one of the things that working with deaf people really uh, taught me in a way is this transparency of the space, is this luminosity of the space, and how important it is for communication. And something very different from the first image I show you in Perform, where the space was like super dark and like. Uh, yeah, made for those who like to smoke hashish and then <laughs> listen to Arabic music. Yeah? Do you, do you want to talk more? Or? I'll just say now a little bit uh, quickly what, uh, what's going to happen here. Okay. Uh, so following, I showed you two of five big projects. I've done uh, three, actually, of uh, six big projects. And there are other things along this nature, projects that took years to, to make in terms of collaboration, human encounter, cooperation, uh, instrument making, activation. Um, but uh, now, like, I'm in a phase where, and for especially here for, for the project that will happen starting end of June, uh, about to do a synthesis of all these ideas, you know, uh, a synthesis on which things I learned from working with deaf communities would infiltrate a project like the Reverse Collection where uh, after years of working with deaf people, I don't need anymore, I don't feel the necessity of having an instrument that is deaf friendly, but that this can happen and be applied onto other instruments. Of also um, having ideas of like how to work with light, space, uh, audience, uh, from within, enter the reverse collection and vice versa. And so I'm, I'm in this uh, phase of uh, taking the compositional principles, the um, ideas uh, of uh, working with space, audience, um, yeah, uh, museal components, and the instruments of all these projects and bringing them together in new configurations and ways that create a different story or that give them like another narration between them and start to talk about other things. And so uh, this synthesis exhibition is the one that will happen uh, here in the, at the, the Hepworth uh, Wakefield at the Leeds Art Gallery and the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, where I'm kind of do, at the moment putting together an orchestra made out of instruments from all these projects. Like, so the reverse collection within, another one I have on uh, harbors and field recordings of cities that have important harbor activities. Uh, one that comes from observations on uh, agricultural and uh, ag uh, architectural practices in China and the Pearl River Delta there. And a big orchestra is being set up. And this orchestra actually will then be blown up in three different venues. So parts of it will be at the Hepworth, parts at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and uh, here at the Leeds Art Gallery. And each in each space, these instruments will work like will be will work as automatons and as uh, create soundscapes and installations specific to to each venue. But then there will be cycles of performances, and after each 
performance, the instruments get shuffled. So like what, 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 you, what used to be at the Hepworth, some elements at the Hepworth will go to the Leeds Art Gallery, others will go to the Yorkshire's Culture Park. And it's like this idea of a shuffled orchestra that every time a major performance or event happens, psh, a, a redistribution takes place and things sound differently and are, are reconnected and represented in another way. And inside this, you can imagine that there will be a lot of protocols of mediation, activation. Actually, I don't talk a lot about mediation. I talk more about activation of working with people who inhabit these spaces and who regularly interact with the instruments and with the audience, but in open ways. Like, it's not necessarily like telling people, oh, for example, you are hired to work inside the exhibition and you have to play between 12 and 1 every day uh, and make an event. No, on the contrary, it's like what I'm thinking about now is how like a living uh, work of art like this one can impact our uh, relationship to the space, to the institution, to the situation that we are in. So like in a way for me, like mediation or like activation is about uh, responding to the situation of somebody having carte blanche to uh, play at any moment they want or to change things within the soundscape that is already existing or to, uh, as I mentioned, maybe answering people's question with a solo or with a performative moment. Uh, that's, for example, ideas of activation. Other activation would be about working with composers who would be invited to make pieces or working with myself um, uh, on uh, certain performative moments or also uh, taking groups um, onto guided tours and workshops. Like all these things, you see, like uh, become for me like activation and like part of a compositional process and approach for me like what I'm doing now and thinking how all these things come together and the conditions and uh, parameters to set up in each space for activation to happen this way is for me composition and that's today what I uh, consider composing or my job as composer much more than creating the performances or the pieces it is creating the infrastructure for all these encounters and uh, events to happen with or without my presence with my with or without guests but through people who choose to inhabit these spaces their desires and sensibilities yes great <laughs> <laughs> okay thank yeah. you thank you, thank you. Thank you.